Radio 1 Stereo. You'd think that people would have had enough of a silly love song. Radio 1 presents Paul McCartney now. What's wrong with that? For the next hour, Paul McCartney talks about making records. I actually enjoy it, you know. If I didn't have to do it, I think I'd try and do it as a hobby. About Michael Jackson. I mean, he's one of the most laid-back, rela- most relaxed people you'll ever meet. Well, the thing is, on the interviews do make him uncomfortable. Mm. You know, I sort of said to him, um, why don't you do interviews, mate? He said, I, I don't feel comfortable. How'd you, how's that for a Michael Jackson impression? Paul McCartney on Critics. But I suppose nowadays that people like the Stones and people who are established like that, the first thing that journalists almost got to say is, well, it, let's get this straight, it's rubbish. And they're old men and it's old hat. On songwriting. It's not easy to develop them. You get, you get an idea and you say it all in the first verse. And then sometimes you look, you look for a little extension in the second verse and it's just not there. You sort of feel, well, I've said everything about that song just in that first verse. And now you can get on to how her brother feels about it or something or, you know, and you look for things, but it doesn't come easily. Paul McCartney on Old Friends. It is cosy and I, in a way, I do like an easy life, you know, so it is very good to have Ringo around drumming. And enemies. He came to our houses and he said, it's going to be a lovely book and I'm really going to do a smashing thing here. And he had some fellow with him who was actually writing it, um, ghosting it and stuff. And we had him in and we did cakes and teas and everything, the whole bit. You know, come and meet the kids, long time since you've seen Uncle Peter. And we were really kind of, you know, introduced him and put him, welcomed him in a lot. And I know uh, he did this with quite a few people on the understanding that he was going to show everyone what he'd written and that we'd all say, well, that's okay, or that's a bit strong or whatever and he basically just went for it in a big way as they say he just got back to the states and just decided to just publish it radio one in stereo presents paul mccartney now featuring tracks from his new album pipes of peace and paul mccartney in conversation with simon bates why are you still recording it's a question that everybody wants me to ask you because you don't need to you are a success you are a star so why the amount of energy that you put into it. Mm. I actually enjoy it, you know. If I didn't have to do it, I think I'd try and do it as a hobby. Just because I really do like doing it. Um, it actually seems strange to me why anyone would think I wouldn't like doing it. Yeah, but you also involve yourself with all the peripheral activities, like people like me coming down, doing television programs, mm. doing what they call promotion, mm. which is hard work, gets away from the real business, which is music, mm. and yet you're prepared to do it. Well, I could have you chucked out. <laughs> point. <laughs> no, I don't mind it, really. I mean, it's like, I, I suppose you, you know, you get, you get to like the whole flavour of the whole thing. And I never really hated doing interviews too much. And I suppose, you know, you, if you're in the, uh, the thing of sort of trying to flog vinyl, to put it bluntly or crudely, you know, which is sort of what the whole thing's uh, roughly about. Let me ask you about flogging vinyl. Does that, that isn't money, though. It can't be money. It's, it's hit, you know, isn't it? Pardon? It's the word hit, isn't it? Um, I don't know what it is, actually. I just do like to do it. If I didn't do it, I'd, I'd have to think of something else to do. It's what I do, you know. It's, I suppose it's like you. You wake up in the morning, you think, what am I going to do today? Oh, I'll go down and be a DJ for the BBC, and then I'll go and open a fair or two, and, you know, you do what you do. Right. And um, if it was possible for you tomorrow not to do it, I'm not sure whether you'd change. Everyone thinks, you know, I think when you win the pools, oh, I'll wait till I give, tell the boss what to do, you know. But I don't have those kind of problems. So I, I do like it, actually. I just like doing it. I think it's more magic than shifting vinyl. Uh, that's, you know, that's not really how I see it. But uh, something about it I like. Let's talk about the album. Take yeah. us through track by track. Um, say, Say, Say is the second track on side one. And that started out when Michael Jackson gave me a ring on the telephone. And he said he'd like to make some hits. So I thought, well, that sounds keen, you know, he sounds positive. <laughs> and I'd never met him, but I'd, I loved his singing and his dancing. And I'd seen him on telly and stuff, so uh, I was keen to meet him anyway. So he came over to England, he was coming over. So I uh, said, let's get together and that. We sat around for an afternoon, and I was plonking a guitar. And um, we came up with the basis of Say, Say, Say. He went back to his hotel and wrote a lot of words for it, and then we sort of thrashed the whole thing together. And um, that's the that's how we done that one. But it just does interest um, me how you make contact. I mean, you, you sit down with Michael Jackson. You've never yeah. met the guy before. Uh-huh. And what actually happens? What's the process? 
Well, I mean, it, to me, it's like anyone with anyone. I just start talking to him and saying, um, you know, just asking him about his life, telling him about mine. Um, sit down and sort of just, I don't know, you just add a little bit, you know, just start talking about stuff. Um, I can't think of any specific thing you do, you know, you don't... Right, sit down there, Michael, now we're going to communicate. <laughs> Look at this now, son. <laughs> you know, it's not going to... I just get out a guitar and we just sit around, you know. I think we know we're both not going to really say much. But it's not so much about talking, actually. It's about letting ideas come to you. I mean, he's one of the most laid-back, rela most relaxed people you'll ever meet. But the thing is, on interviews do make him uncomfortable. Mm. You know, I sort of said to him... Um, why don't you do interviews, mate? He said, I, I don't feel comfortable. Now, how'd you, how's that for a Michael Jackson impression? Very good. <laughs> no, but he, he's... Um, and I, I can go for that. I mean, I know exactly what he means. I've done it all these years. And you do them. They're not that bad to do. But he's very shy of doing them. And I know what he's talking about. I mean, I'm just... Maybe I don't I know. I bluff it out a bit more. So, right, well, let's do it. You know, go and do it. And I don't really find him that bad. It's funny, actually, when we were doing the video for Say, Say, Say... Um, we were in California and a lot of school kids came around and Michael's fella said, do you mind meeting all these school kids? You know, Michael would like to and all that. And I said, no, I don't mind. I'm happy to. You know, it's just a bunch of kids. So uh, I'm, I'm walking out there and we're going down the line. You feel like the president or somebody <laughs> will vote for me and not him. <laughs> you know, and we're both of us going down this line and everyone's saying, well, I'm so pleased to meet you and all this stuff. And halfway through it in the London... Uh, vernacular, Michael bottles out. He says, oh, I really can't do this, you know, I really hate this. I mean, he says, it's all right, you know. Anyway, I don't want to kind of go gossiping about him too much, but it is, he finds that kind of thing a bit difficult, so I think he gets the reputation of being tense in those kind of situations. Having met you once, mm. I said, looked at the videos and said, oh, well, that's McCartney, of course. McCartney mm. all over there. Yeah. Am I wrong or right? You're wrong, Sally. <laughs> Your bum's out the window, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> no, it was Bob Giraldi's as the director. Mm. He came over, and it, that was the way he saw Michael and I. And I thought it was a good way to get round the age gap. The yeah. age gap? Yeah, well, I'm twice his age, aren't I, nearly? I mean, he's, he's like 23. But that Michael. never occurred to anybody, I don't think. No, because it was done well. Oh. If it hadn't have been done well, it might have. And, uh, you know, I think... That was one of the good things about it, that I was a kind of elder brother figure, which is how I feel to him anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I treat him a bit like that, and we have a laugh and stuff. But uh, it's not deadly serious. We, we actually have a great time together. A lot of care and attention put into that, and presumably a lot of time as well. It was three very big, hectic days, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, it was one of those, you know, up early and then just work all day, ridiculously. But working with Mike, he's uh, so talented that when we have to do a thing... You don't have to think about his bit, and he's doing it, and it's all good. And you've got to work to keep up with him, you know. <laughs> so uh, it was great, actually. It was a crazy time. Um, but after the three days, you know, I needed a good kip. But uh, that was it. Let's talk about the rest of the album. The Other Me is a track I, you know, I, I say stuff that, uh, obviously, that, that I think, you know, uh, stuff, stuff that isn't just completely made up from the imagination. Uh, will generally be something that's been running through my mind. And one of the themes that I sometimes think about is um, the other me that, that can be uh, a bit better than I normally am. You know, In what way? How, I don't know, how you'd wish you'd be. I mean, if you have an argument and you sit after it and you sort of think, oh, I wish I hadn't done that, I don't like these. And then, so that would have been the other me that wouldn't have argued. And uh, that kind of idea, you know, that, there's, that inside all of us there is someone quite groovy. And you meet him maybe when you're drunk, and you meet him a few times, you know, but he generally doesn't come out. With well, the fantasist. You know, the, the other you. It's six months since we talked to you about Broad Street. We know the pattern of it. How's it going? It's going great, actually. It's, uh, most of the photography's been done, um, and George Martin and myself are now working on the music. <clears throat> and we've got it down now to the... We've, we've done the songs in it. There are, um, I think it's 12 songs. It, it sort of grows all the time, this All one. original songs, all McCartney songs? No, they're a mixture. Some of them, it's a kind of equal balance. Some of them are old songs I'm known for. Some of them are new songs. Some of them are uh, not old, but kind of of, of the recent past couple of years. Uh, so it's a really a mixture that was basically chosen for the film to kind of support what was being said in the film. You know, we knew we were going to go to a big film studio in the, in the plot. 
So we wanted something that uh, we could do a big filmy thing with. So we chose a song like Ballroom Dancing off Tug of War that we could all dress up as Ted's and we could all really get into, you know, we could do a big production thing. So, so they're chosen for reasons like that. It's ended up as a bit of a mixture um, of my stuff. And then <clears throat> at the point we're at at the moment, we're doing the incidental music. So when you see a car travelling from there to there, they nearly always have a diddle and diddle or something. And that's very interesting to do because we're just making that up to picture, something I've never done before. Um, so it's great, it's good fun doing it, and uh, it should be finished pretty soon. And the cinema's in this country? Yeah, for the cinema. Uh, Tracy Ullman was talking about it, and she mm. said she didn't understand a word of it, but as far as she could gather, it was one long chase with a lot of fun inside. Well, what happened was, uh, the producer, bless his little cotton socks, decided in his great wisdom that he wouldn't give people scripts, <laughs> and that he just would give them their little bit, and, you know, and Tracy's thing can be you could you can take it and it still makes sense outside the, the thing so a lot of the people in the film still don't know what the film's about you know they know what their bits about <laughs> but they they weren't there for all the rest of the filming so they're all wandering around saying well i know what this is bit oh i get i see that you know and um, it's it's being glued together now at the moment and it start you know it makes sense the more you see of it um I say, Tracy hasn't actually seen most of it. She's going to be surprised. Her release when, Paul? I think summer 84. Mm -hmm. If we're all still here. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, let's get back to the album. Keep Undercover. Um, Keep Undercover was the first track we did when we were doing Tug of War sessions. And it was going to go on that album, but it didn't fit. Uh, and it wasn't finished at the time. It didn't fit? It didn't fit in with the mood of the album. It seemed lighter, which fits more in with this mood, which is uh, more uh, popular, I think. The criticism in the States has almost invariably been exactly that. It's pop, not mm. what we expect. Mm. Well, of course, you know, really, it's blues delta, but what do they know? <laughs> well, it just struck me. I, I looked at the Rolling Stone review, which I thought was the most absurd thing I've ever read in my life. Mm. I don't know. You know, you can't... You can't uh, expect good reviews anymore there was a time when you could sort of bring something out and someone would say uh, this is quite good i'm not that keen on this i think you should do this but uh you know there's something good about it um but i suppose nowadays that people like the stones and people who are established like that the first thing that journalists almost got to say is well it, let's get this straight it's rubbish and they're old men and it's old hat but I detect uh, a bit of a change of mood, actually, because uh, over the years, one of the things I thought that was crazy about this thing, I mean, I think the newspapers were nice for a while. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> a long time ago. And then they got really sour, and they were kind of against everything, against uh, Rod Stewart and me and people uh, who were sort of established. And I think in some cases, I think obviously, like, it was quite right. There were a lot of cobwebs needed uh, wiping away i think so after the 60s there have been a lot of kind of you know cobwebs i think so i think some of it was good um a lot of it had to be shocking uh and had to really be something other than what had gone down so peace and love did go out the window and it was like war and hate kind of or you know yeah. knife yourself for a laugh time and um which i don't think a lot of people could get with but it needed to happen and i think during that period the uh the musical press, a lot of them, uh, thought they were that too and decided to be real heavy men and, and, you know, some of them I actually knew who weren't heavy at all, they were funny little journalists. I mean, you know, okay, so maybe he knows something and stuff, but he didn't know that much and in this particular case I thought that uh, what was happening was they were slagging off the people and all the people, as you say, it would hurt them. So it was only repressing them. It was just like teachers sla slapping you and, and repression. It's really what, what it was to some degree, I think. Mm. And I think you found a lot of the older guys who were quite willing to kind of keep going and love their music, because they did love it. They getting slagged off so much, it was like, oh, God, who, who, who wants this? And I know a lot of people were turned off. The thing. But I think that what's happened is that a lot of public were turned off with that attitude, too. I, I've found in the last few years, a lot of people say, yes. I don't read the musicals anymore. That's just right. don't do it, man. You know, just, uh, I don't, I've given them up. And... I think you're finding now with some of the other publications that are coming in where it's like a decent picture of your star hero 
and something vaguely nice about him yes. and some facts and figures and the words of his song, which is really what fans, I think, sort of want. Don't, I don't Couldn't think they want to hear. I think those, what's happening is the sales are coming back for those. So these slaggers often realise they're talking themselves out of a job, yeah. which isn't too clever, whichever way they look at it. Why so bad? Um, I wrote uh, what seemed to me just a kind of little tune that was very, very simple. And sometimes when you get tunes like that, you, you worry about them. You think it's just too simple. It must be another song. Or um, maybe it's, it's just too simple to just sit there. But uh, with So Bad, I liked it, you know, and uh, I, mean, I don't want to go on just saying how I like all my own stuff and that. But uh, this particular tune, you know, is struck me as being a nice simple tune and um main memory for me on it is the reason why it says boy i love you so bad is that i used to sing girl i love you so bad and uh what happened was my son who's six was feeling a bit left out you know and i could sort of see this so i had to work in boy i love you so bad too so we had a little bit with the girl says uh, where well, i say and she said boy i love you and then he'd smile you see at that little bit so that's how i worked that in um, boy, I'm be so bad. Let me ask you just about your family, because you've got the situation now where your kids are alive and kicking in every single way. How do they regard Dad, and how do they relate Dad in terms of their friends, because there must be all, all that problem. I think um, I'm always very aware of that, because I know what it was like at school, you know, and even if anyone's dad was a policeman, you know, they got kicked about. And, but um, my kids, they seem to kind of like to support me. Now, you know, I don't know how much of that's real, mm. whatever, but I'll believe as much of it as I, you know, as, as they'll let me believe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just think you were on Noel Edmonds the other week. Yeah. I mean, do they sit and watch you and say, oh, God, why did you say no, that? No, they're not. Gonna... That's what I mean. That, strangely enough, you know, they, they don't. They say, that was great, Dad, and Mom looked great, and it was oh, I was good and all that. They're very supportive, actually. That's great. Yeah, Let's get back to side two of the answer. Okay, side two. The song The Man was... Um, after Michael Jackson and myself had written Say, 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 um, Michael wanted to keep going, and I had a bit of an idea for an introduction, which is the introduction of the man. Um, and I was playing it to him, you know, on the piano, and sort of saying, look, how's about this chords and that? And uh, the, the way we worked was we had a cassette going. And then after that little session, he took it back to his hotel and appeared the next day with the entire words to the whole thing, you know, oh good, thank you, very <laughs> much, ching, <laughs> two and six for you, and, uh, and uh, that was it, He'd, you know, so it was like, music me, generally, and uh, words Michael on that. Music you and words him, um, did you look at the words and possibly slightly resent the idea of somebody else doing, taking the idea and then adapting it? No, I, I liked the words, you know, I liked uh, what he'd done and stuff, it seemed to fit. Um, I, I'm not really fussy, you know, I do so much, and I've had so many hits, that I'm not really jealous of anyone else having them. Uh, I'm not, you know, because I've, I've done very well, you know, so I can't afford to just sort of sit back and not be too jealous when someone comes up with something uh, that's good. I just wondered how, how the hell you stand back and judge something when you're so involved with it. That's one of the most difficult things, I think, about doing anything, is, is standing back and seeing how it is. I suppose if you do a painting... You can do a thing and think, wow, that's it. It's incredible, you know. Or, you know, it happens in millions of ways. Then the next morning you can look at it and the, uh, draw the curtains and it, the daylight comes in on it. And, oh, God, and it's horrible. You know, and I was a bit... I had a few too many and it looked great last <laughs> night or whatever, you know. Do you ever get that happen to you? And, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, not paintings because I don't really do much painting. But, uh, yeah, you know, I can. we can do a track and I can really think it's good and then listen to it the next day and think, hmm, well, you know, we should do that again should fix that you see i can imagine he said i'm putting myself in your position which is always a dangerous thing to do if i went out on a limb and i said that's terrific on wednesday night and i came in on thursday morning i might find it hard to admit that i was wrong in fact i do mm. every day <laughs> <find it hard>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um well you know that's another way to go I, have, I i think that's all right too you know if you want to bluff it out that's okay <laughs> by me sorry no, i do that too you know sometimes you just can't admit it's no good and you bluff your way through it you know but it's a strange mixture isn't it life you know you just, uh, 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you all about it. So, have you got a couple of hours? <laughs> no, you know. I mean, I, I, I do find myself getting a bit comical when you start saying things like that. But when you are 40, 41, as I am, I, I, you do start kind of thinking, well, you know, it is strange about life. At 20, you just say, well, that's funny, so la vie. You don't really think it. But, but, but tell me about 40, you know, you are really thinking, cool, it's a pretty amazing affair, isn't it, you know? With, what with all the stuff we get up to. Is it good or bad? It's all right. In fact, it's amazing. <laughs> Quite amazing. It just depends what mood you're in, doesn't it? Uh, I think. Um, Sweetest Little Show in Town was originally uh, one-third of a medley thing. We strung three little pieces together. It's something I've uh, done for a while now. You know, if you've got... Some songs won't go beyond the first verse. They just... It's not easy to develop them. You get you get an idea, and you say it all in the first verse, and then sometimes you look you look for a little extension in the second verse, and it's just not there. You sort of feel, well, I've said everything about that song just in that first verse, and now you can get on to how her brother feels about it or something, or, you know, and you look for things, but it doesn't come easily. So you find yourself stuck with just what was going to be a song, but stopped short, you know, and it's just it's like a little painting instead of a big one. And what I found myself doing over the years with things like that is seeing if any of them will join together to make a sort of longer piece. And this was going to go with two others, but we didn't like the two others in the end. It didn't join up right. And, um, but we liked the sweetest little show bit. So um, we merged that through into a track called Average Person, which, was, which had a sort of showy feel. We wanted that to have a kind of stage show feel. You can imagine a bunch of people coming. Oh, there was a great quote from Ringo Starr about five weeks ago that I saw in the States, which I don't think was apocryphal, I think it's true. And he, he was asked, not specifically about Pete Brown's book, book but about all the books that exhume the Beatles mm. and all the rest of it. And he was asked mm. if he would do an autobiography. And in the quote was, no, it's my life, I know what happened, I don't give a damn what anybody else says. Mm. Which I thought was a great quote. Mm. I just wondered if you'd agree with that. And how you view all those exploitation books? Um, yeah, well, I, I feel about the same as he does, and I know uh, George does. I mean, we... And I know John did. You know, we, you generally... You know that when you get uh, to a certain level of fame, people are going to just bring out books no matter what, you know, and you get Bridget Bardot saying, I want to go to Saint Tropez, and they're still there snapping her. We get Crazy Garber saying, I want to be alone. It's, uh, it seems to be unavoidable, really. And uh, so, to tell you the truth, I don't read them most of the time. Peter Brown's one was a betrayal because he came to our houses and he said, it's going to be a lovely book and I'm really going to do a smashing thing here. And he had some fellow with him who was actually writing it, um, ghosting it and stuff. And we had him in and we cakes and teas and everything, the whole bit, you know, come and meet the kids, long time since you've seen Uncle Peter, and we were really kind of, you know, introducing him, putting him, welcomed him in a lot, and I know uh, he did this with quite a few people, on the understanding that he was going to show everyone what he'd written, and that we'd all say, well, that's okay, or that's a bit strong, or whatever, and he basically just went for it, in a big way, as they say, he just got back to the States and just decided to just publish it, he never showed us a... And in the end, he sent me a copy of it saying, I hope you like it, you know, isn't it lovely and all that. Uh, I'm afraid I had a little burning ceremony <laughs> with that particular number. But uh, that's it, you know, what can you do? You know, some people are genuine friends, some people aren't. But do they hurt you? Because, I, I mean, I find them pretty distasteful, it but hurts. they don't concern me directly. It leaves my left toe throbbing. In that case, we'll leave it at that. Through Our Love. <laughs> Through Our Love is a love song. Um, is it to anybody? It's, uh, well, to me, it, it's to Linda, who's my yeah. missus. For, for anybody else listening to it, it's hopefully it's for their uh, friend, whoever it be. Um, in my mind, it's, it's a good one for, like, newly marrieds. If you're going to get behind marriage and not just sort of think, oops, we got married, what do we do now? If you're going to get behind it, you took actually vows, and you can either, we giggle through ours, but afterwards... You know, because it's also funny standing up there saying it all dead serious now, and Linda was hooting away. But, <laughs> um, but afterwards, you realise you have stood up in front of someone and you've said, yes, I will, and I'll promise to be okay to her, and, you know, in sickness and in health. And I think there can be a great feeling, uh, if you're lucky, uh, 
with newlyweds, where you do start thinking, hey, you know, this is different, and we can do stuff we couldn't do, and we're now, I heard someone talking about yesterday, two halves of a, two people are really only a half each, and when they sort of come together in something like love or a, a good relationship like that, is that they really become, how you feel? oh, yeah, and I do, I think that that is great, you know, when you have those sort of periods when hopefulness is at its height, I think that's good for you, I think it feels great. It's optimistic. You can get on with things without just worrying all the time. Um, it would be nice to think it could last longer than it lasts, but um, then you get whatever you get. And it, it's suddenly, um, you know, Maxwell's Silver Hammer or something for our older viewers. Um, you know, some, somehow something will go wrong, something will happen, because that's what I mean. That's, that's life. Um, Are you an up-and-down person? Yeah. Uh, Good I've never today, met anyone. Yeah, I've never actually met anyone who isn't. I've met some people who are a little more um, uh, consistent than I am, um, but you know, in this in this thing through our love, uh, the thing for me is like the optimism, so that even if you're up or down, um, I like optimistic statements myself. Is it because you use them to to cheer yourself? Yeah, up? I need. I feel that this is um, uh, a kind of. Uh, it, life is something that no one knows about, even Monty Python. Right. Nobody's got it down. The, the Pope, from the Pope to the lowliest vicar in the thing, they, they might think they've got stuff down, but I've discovered nobody's got it down. I've met prime ministers, presidents, the whole bit, you know, and they're all very just like us. So, um, uh, generally, I think it's agreed, you know, that for most people it's up and down. You know, you get, you've got a job, you lose your job. Something's great, you win the pools or whatever you win that's good, and then something bad happens. And I think that that is why you need some kind of faith, even if it is only, it'll work out. I mean, with the Beatles, our thing used to be, our faith used to be something will happen. Whatever happened, you know, we'd be broken down on a van up the M1, you know, and the, the windscreen had kicked in, so some of it, a pebble or something, we'd be crawling along trying to see the curb, you know. It, it, just, it still got it. Ringo saying, left a bit, and I'm pulling left. He's saying, no, no. And he, he, he's got his hands mixed up. <laughs> but all of that, you know, I mean, all the craziness going down. And we say, God, you know, what's going to happen, you know? And someone is going to say, something will happen. And that, to me, that's why I like optimistic statements. Just as someone goes, ding, they go, oh. And for a second, it's okay again, and it just gives you the strength. Because you used Ringo. Used is a horrible, yeah, horrible yeah, word. Yeah, used is. You used Played Ringo. With. You exactly. With. Eric Stewart, Andy Mackay, yeah. all hand-picked people. Yeah. When they come in, do they? It's difficult. To, you're talking mm. to a non-musician. Do they mm. contribute in a real sense, or do you tell them what to do and then they add bits? It's a bit of both, really. Uh, if people just contribute. Um, they can sometimes say, well, you know, what do you want me to do? It's your record, it's your song. So I, I find a bit of both is the one. Um, never saying to anyone, this is what you do, and don't you dare go to the left or right of that. That gets them, you know, nobody likes that. But, but by the same argument, I say sometimes, if you don't tell people anything, I've had it where people have told me off for telling them too much, and then I've backed off completely and said, okay, well, you work it out. For about half an hour, they say, well, come on, produce us, you know, what do you want? Do you want me to do that or that? What do you do then? You say, I think it'd be good if you did that. And if that, you know. You surround yourself by familiar, by people who are familiar to you, mm. uh, and people who are first rate at what they do. Is that because you need their musical ability or because you feel more secure with them, with familiar names like Ringo? Well, actually, there's only a few familiar names. Michael Jackson I'd never recorded with ever before. Ringo, of course, I had a lot. Steve, I had never. Steve Gadd, I'd never recorded with till a uh, Tug of War album. Mm. Eric, I'd never worked with before, except the last couple of years. Um, be, but before that, I'd never worked with him. Andy, uh, I've worked with a bit. Stanley, I hadn't done before. So, uh, in actual fact, I don't know a lot of these people, and uh, some of the times that's that's worse. I mean, I wish I I had sort of just got people around me who just was a security blanket, you know, because. They've got to meet me, I've got to meet them, and we've got to then do music together. So what's the criteria? Have you asked? Uh, that was good question, music. stupid question number no, three. No, 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 it wasn't a stupid question, no, because I do understand what you mean about... Um, it is cosy, and I, in a way, I do like an easy life, you know, so it is very good to have Ringo around drumming, because I know him, and he knows me, and George Martin. It's, it's good to have your security blankets, no, no bones about that, miss. You know, because uh, why not? Pipes of Peace, tell me about it. Pipes of Peace, I was actually... Uh, 
I got a letter off George Melly, an old friend. That would be right. All right. And um, he said that some society that was uh, looked after kids wasn't the Pestalozzi people who are the choir of children that sing on it, but it was uh, some society of kind of, you know, united children's of the world job. Um, wanted, we're interested in uh, getting a song that would sort of say, point up the plight of kids, you know, a, a charity song, really. And um, so I plonked away for a bit and and got a, a bit of the song, which is I'd call the verse, this um, first bit, in answer to George's request. Um, then it sort of changed a little bit and became Pipes of Peace, which I thought, well, you know, that's still doing what he wanted, really, you know, which was like anything really to... Uh, say to people, I feel this way about all those poor kids in Beirut or wherever it is at, at any given time. I feel that it is good to help rather than turn your back. And so, therefore, I mean, you find, I suppose, you, I don't know if you do, but I find a lot of people these days worried about how it's all going to work out or even if it's going to get beyond next year, you know. So, really, for me, it's just, if I've got some kind of opportunity to say, let's look after the kids, you know, and let's be, uh, let's, uh, in 60s terminology, let's vibe it and let's, let's, you know, let's do it right. Instead of just really get it wrong and blow ourselves up, I find myself doing that, you know. Um, I don't really want to preach, but I just want to say that I think that kind of thing is a good idea. And I think most people do support it, strangely enough. First of all, people will accuse you of preaching. And secondly, that people, particularly in this country, oddly enough, will mm. be embarrassed by an honest statement like that. Mm. Does it worry you that they will say either of those two things? Well, I don't know. You know, I've, I don't really know if they will. Uh, you know, we're, only, we're guessing. Oh, there's bound to be one out there. Um, no, it, what happens is you have to not let it worry you. In truth, you know, you're just a person, and anyone who slags off anything, um, you don't say, wow, isn't that great? Look at this. Here, love, look at this. He really hates me. Isn't this great? <laughs> you know, I don't think there's anyone like that. So you, you never really like it. Um, I'm a bit aware these days that I can be, you know, to some people, embarrassing. I suppose really my answer to them would be, well, just don't buy it. Don't listen to it. Turn it off whenever you hear it. It's simple as that, really. Uh, anybody else who likes it, I'm not going to stop it just because they don't like it. Because there's plenty of people who do like it. And I actually enjoy doing it. So rock on, Tommy. Mm -hmm. 